What is going on, everybody? This is your boy, the Scripture Plug, and today we're continuing on with the series with Alpha Deed and Anthony Rogers breaking down the Trinity in the Old Testament. So we've watched so far up till now, episodes one through six, and today we're going to be getting into seven and eight. And it seems like from the titles of both of these videos, they're going to be discussing Jesus being the angel of the Lord. So I can't wait to get into it, can't wait to learn, and just continue to get a better understanding of our scriptures via the brothers that take the time to learn and give us this type of information. So without further ado, we're going to get into it, we're going to rock out, appreciate everybody in the chat right now, but let's get some learning in. Shout out Alpha Deed, and again, Anthony Rogers, CRA International, if you want to follow uh, Alpha Deed, and then Anthony Rogers on YouTube if you want to follow Anthony Rogers here in studio to do the uh, to do so and to join me in expounding on the rich passages of the Old Testament that clearly have revealed to us all the members of the Trinity regardless of the fact that many times people deny that uh, uh, we worship one God the scripture is very clear that we worship one God who revealed himself to us in three distinct persons. Today's focus is going to be on the so-called the angel of the Lord, and we'll show you how that ties back into the Son of God. Anthony, welcome back, brother. Thank you. Great to be with you. So I'll turn it over to you, brother. Okay, yeah. So as a reminder, we, we've... Uh, started out looking at passages like Isaiah 63, which talk about the Father, the Son, or the Angel of the Lord, and the Spirit. And what we've seen throughout this series is that each of those persons are identified as divine persons. In the last couple of episodes, we've focused on the Father, and in explaining how God is a Father in the Old Testament, we looked at the various ways in which He is a Father. Right. Ultimately, we say He's the Father of the Son in the Trinity. Uh, now, what we want to do is focus in on the Angel of the Lord. And to do that, you know, we, we did somewhat touch on a few things in the course of this because we didn't want people to be uh, confused. But now we want to do that in a little bit more detail. A lot of people will stumble over the idea that we're saying the angel of the Lord is God. And the reason they're stumbling is for whatever reason, historically, people have come to use the English word angel exclusively for created heavenly beings. And that is so true. So many times people have this depiction of what angels are. And, you know, some people have like the understanding of, oh, it's like the little babies that are blonde hair and blue eyes. Or nowadays, if you go on social media, they got all the 50 million eyed angels and whatnot. And just having that understanding. And again, I think people like uh, obviously Anthony Rogers and others who can break down the Hebrew and break down the understanding of where these words come from and what these words actually means. And for all those who are out there that try to argue and fight, angel just means messenger. Again, what type of angel you are has nothing to do with the word angel being used. The, how we figure out what type of being it is is through the context of the surrounding passages. So when it comes to the angel of the Lord, we know that's Yahweh because in Exodus, when uh, the angel of the Lord is seen, it's called or he's called Yahweh. Uh, when we see the angel in Revelation, we know that that's just an angel or a spirit being that's not Yahweh because when it comes time for John to worship the angel, he's like, no, nah, I don't do that. So we can see in the context of what type of angel there are, whether it be a, a person, um, whether it be uh, uh, some sort of other object of, like the donkey, for example, all these other ways we can see that there's different types of messengers, which are angels, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the angel that's there is the heavenly divine spiritual being that most people see as little babies. So we got to get that understanding and again, shout out to these brothers for breaking it down. I'm pretty sure they're going to break it down, obviously with the title of it being the angel of the Lord. So shout out to them and also everybody who knows the ones who know, know and the ones who don't hopefully get to know one. Right. But that's not how the Hebrew and Greek texts use the word for angel, right? In, uh, in Hebrew, if we look at our first slide, uh, a person can go and look at any reference work they want on Hebrew grammar. You can look at Gesenius, who's the father of all Hebrew lexicons. You can look at uh, BDB, whatever standard right. reference work you want to look at. The Hebrew word malach means messenger. 
That's right. It, it doesn't tell us what kind of being is being spoken of. It's just referring to anybody who speaks, right? Anyone who speaks can be called a messenger. That's right. And so even, for example, if, if we wanted to, uh, you know, the, the donkey that speaks in, in Numbers 22, right, when God miraculously causes the With donkey. Balaam, yeah. Yeah. He's a messenger. Because he's delivering a message. Right. And so the word there is angel, if, if we translate it the way the word is often translated. But obviously, that doesn't mean he's somebody that surrounds God's throne or something like that. Uh, so the word just means uh, a messenger. Only the context can tell us what kind of being we're talking about. All right. So if we go uh, to the next slide, we have an example of what I'm talking about. This is Genesis 32, verses 1 and 2, and pay, pay close attention. I have a, you know, a couple things uh, underlined here, but it says, Now as Jacob went on his way, angels of God met him. This, th what it's talking about is Jacob is now leaving uh, his father-in-law with That's his right. wives, That's right. and uh, he's going to meet his brother Esau. Now this is a problem on both ends, right? The last time he saw Esau, Esau was angry with him. And wanted to kill him. <laughs> right. Now Laban is not so happy either because he's leaving with his daughters. I mean, he's married them, but Laban had Jacob as basically a slave, right? He was making him do all this stuff for uh, you know, very little uh, return. Uh, so Jacob is leaving one angry person and heading towards another one. And so as he's on his way, it says, angels of God met him. Plural, right? Right, it's in the plural. Yeah. And then it says, Jacob said when he saw them, this is God's camp. So the presence of angels indicated to him that uh, God is dwelling there, right? God is there uh, with Jacob. And so obviously angels here re does refer to the heavenly host, mm -hmm. right? If, if their presence signals the divine presence that God is dwelling there, then it must refer to those angels. But notice what it goes on to say. Well, he names the place uh, Mahanaim, which refers to it as God's camp. Now, I don't, I mean, obviously this is like the English text, and obviously the Hebrew is not the same, because I could be wrong, but if I'm not mistaken, Hebrew doesn't have like capital and stuff like that. But the fact right here, when the breakdown is in the English, and the, the angels is lowercase, but if I'm not mistaken, the angel of the Lord is always capitalized. So that's always to be something, at least for us English speakers, to remember in the uh, identification of who the angel of the Lord is as opposed to these particular angels and how, again, the angel of the Lord can also be known as. Now, again, I, with that being said, I understand that's an English thing. That's not, you know, a, a Hebrew thing or anything else like that. But for us, getting a good understanding and how we how we read it anyway, that's one indicating factor, at least for me, that I can understand uh, the, the type of angel being talked about as well at the time. But then it says, then after that, Jacob sent messengers before him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. So now he's sending an entourage of people to uh, prepare the way for them, you know, uh, going to Esau and saying, your brother's coming, you know. And, and of course, we know from the rest of the story, they bring gifts and other things. He's buttering up his brother, right? That's right. That's <laughs> don't, right. don't kill me when you see me. But here's what people may not notice. The word for angels in verse 1 is messengers in is, verse 3. Right. It's the same, right. same Hebrew word. So no Hebrew speaker would read a passage like this and, and stumble. They would understand the word angel doesn't always refer to one of the heavenly hosts. You can only know from the context what kind of being is in view. And so the significance of that is then when we, when we hear about the angel of the Lord, we can't just assume it's talking about a creature. Right? It doesn't mean that. It doesn't tell us anything more than that this person is somehow coming for the purpose of speaking, if nothing more. That's right. Right. It, it, it doesn't tell us anything further. We have to look at the context. Now, there, there's something uh, of further speak. interest about the angel. The, the phrase in Hebrew, this is one way you can know when God is speaking about the angel of the Lord and referring to a divine person as opposed to a created angel or a human messenger. One is that this full phrase is used exclusively for him, right? In the first place, it's definite in Hebrew. In Hebrew, uh, you, when you, whenever you have two nouns together, if uh, it's called a noun sentence, it's a it's a construct relationship. If the second noun is a proper noun, then the whole sentence is definite. Meaning, uh, the phrase in Hebrew is Melach Yahweh. Yahweh is a proper noun, so the whole sentence is properly rendered the mm. angel, angel of, the, of Lord. the Lord. Exactly. Right. That's when we translate it, basically. Right. So that yeah. points to him as a specific individual. It's not just an angel. 
That's right. Any old angel. It's the angel, the angel of the Lord. A second thing to note is that this phrase is never plural in Hebrew. It's always singular. So We don't talk about the angels of the Lord. We no. talk about angels, right. but when we talk about the angel of the Lord, it's specifically one individual. Right, in the Bible, right, because sometimes people will speak loosely. People don't realize how the Bible restricts this usage uh, to one specific person. So some people, maybe in ordinary conversation, might say the angels of the Lord. But what we're pointing out is in the Bible, it only speaks of one person this way. That's right. Elsewhere, it speaks of angels, but never angels of the Lord. Right. Right. right or it right. might say angels of God. They use a different title. But this one is this. In other words, this is a special title for one uh, particular individual. Right. Right. Now let's look at uh, to close out today. We'll we'll look at a passage where this is very clear uh, from the scriptures. This is the first recorded mention of the angel of the Lord in the Bible. And this passage uh, is, is remarkable for a number of reasons. But as you know, in the context, uh, Sir, uh, Hagar is fleeing from Sarai. That's right. Right. She's not happy. She's going back to Egypt. But while she's on her way, suddenly someone encounters her. And what's, what's remarkable, people don't read closely very often, and they should. Uh, it starts off in verse 7 saying, Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. He said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? And when I said that people don't read very closely, what most people might assume is she, she's now encountering someone that she knows to be the angel of the Lord. That's not what it says. Mm -hmm. The angel of the Lord doesn't announce himself to her. That's he doesn't right. tell her who he is. That's right. Right. We know that because the narrator, Moses, told Correct. us that's who it is. All she knows is out of the blue, somebody's come to her and said, where are you going? And then she says, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. Right? And then moving on to the, the next verses, notice how the angel of the Lord speaks to her. This has to be surprising, right? Again, it's, it's the narrator telling us, then the angel of the Lord said to her, right? So she, again, doesn't know it's the angel. But he says to her, return. I know he's about to break it down, and we all see it right there. We all see what's underlined. I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will be too many to count. I will. So the angel of the Lord is going to do this. The angel of the Lord, the, 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 whoever the angel of the Lord is, has the power to do something like this. Throughout the entirety of the uh, Old Testament, the angel of the Lord is the one doing these things. A lot of these people that are Unitarians and Jehovah's Witnesses, they'll say, oh, well, that's just the agency aspect of it. I, if I'm not mistaken, and I think they're probably going to break it down. I think they've broken it down before. And, you know, people like Dr. Michael Brown's broken down many times. Agency doesn't mean that you can just take on the title of that particular person or be called that particular person. Uh, what you can do is you can uh, display certain things or you can be in the power of, but nowhere does it say like uh, much like um you know Moses splitting the red sea right obviously we know that was God doing it um and, and we and we get that understanding when it comes to the angel of the lord the angel of the lord is doing everything that it is that he's saying he's going to do and he's also doing in a manner and, and the things that he is doing are uh, the things that only God can do so we got to get that understanding it's not about agency cuz agency it, it it doesn't equate to being able to uh display and be the person that you're supposed to be the agent for. So we got to have that understanding. Uh, uh, an agency works on behalf of another party. Mm, let them know, Rabbi. Let them know. So that agency stuff for them Je uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and Unitarians ain't going to fly. It is not going to fly. Mm -mm. Let's get back to it. Turn to your mistress and submit yourself to her authority. That had to be surprising. <laughs> Who's this person to tell me this? So she has to know at least that whoever this is, this person assumes a lot of authority. And then he confirms that by what he promised right. her now. Right. right. Yeah. So then in verse 10, it says, Moreover, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will be too many to count. He didn't say God. He said, I will. Right. This, right. And this is the same thing that God says later to Abraham, isn't That's right. it? That's right. So, so this person who assumes authority over her to demand that she go back to her mistress and submit to her, also tells her he's going to greatly multiply her descendants. He technically uh, said, I'm going to create your descendants. Yeah, and, and that's got to be surprising too because, uh, 
you know, it, it assumes that she's going to have a child, right? That's right. Yeah, there was no X-rays or uh, MRIs at that time, or right. ultrasounds, or anything like that, right? Right. So as we go to the the next uh, several verses, then it says, "The angel of the Lord said to her further, Behold, you are with child." We don't even know if she knew that she had a child. At That's that right. Point. That's right. Right. But he knows, and then he furthermore says, "You know, you're going to bear a son. You shall name him or his name Ishmael, because the, now this pay close attention again because." The Lord has given heed to your affliction. Now, this is remarkable because, remember, we just saw that the angel speaks in the first person as and God. And ask her while you're leaving, right? Yeah. But, but he says, I'm going to multiply your descendants. Yeah. You go back and submit to Sarah. So he's speaking as if he's God. But now he speaks about God. On behalf of, you know, like as a messenger. Yeah. Because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. So in some sense, the angel speaks and reveals himself to be God, but yet also distinguishes himself from somebody who's also identified as God. That's right. That's right. And, and to further identify who he is, he, he makes a uh, he, he basically tells Hagar the character, the nature of her child. He says in verse 12, he will be a wild donkey of a man, his hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him, and he'll live to the east of all his brothers. So he's predicting even future you know, of the lifestyle and the character of this child that she'll bear. Right. And he doesn't say anything like, you know, thus says the Lord, like he's a prophet, right? That's this, right. This right. angel comes, assumes divine authority, speaks as God, and even reveals that she's going to have a child, what his name will be. Uh, so this person is clearly no ordinary individual. That's right. And again, now here's how the story concludes. But again, I'm going to say that people often – you know, don't read very closely, and I'll show you what I mean. But notice in verse 13, it says, Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are a God who sees. For she said, Have I e even remained alive after seeing him? Here, here there's a bit of a play on words. Uh, she's remarking, remark uh, she's puzzling over the fact that she's seen God and yet has lived, and yet he's seen her, which is, you know, he sees everything about her. He knows she has a child. Uh, he, he tells her about the future course of the child's life. So she recognizes this is God. Now, I've had people say to me, I've had Jewish people say to me, well, Hagar was wrong. She's just overwhelmed by this experience. And so she mistakenly <laughs> calls him God. Right. Now, now that's... Whoa, hold on now, y'all. That's crazy. That's crazy that people are like, nah, she was just tripping. That's the response that people have, Jewish folk. Nah, she was just tripping. She was just crazy. She's like, oh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, they tried to say that with um, uh, Thomas, too. When he's like, uh, my Lord and my God. I've heard that people try to say, oh, he was just shocked. So he's just like, you know, throwing it out there. What? What type of sense does that make that these people have to reach to these lengths? Jewish folks, whoever, got to reach these lengths. And what's crazy is I bet people are going to see Probably a few people in the comments, too, are probably going to see where it says, you are a God. And be like, oh, see there? It's not the God. It's not the almighty God. She's saying you are a God. Ooh. People are going to attach to that. It's going to be really ridiculous. Uh, but that's what people have to do because they don't allow the hearts to be softened. They have the hardened hearts, and they want to read the scriptures with one eye closed or one eye open or both eyes closed, however they want to go about it. But the truth of the matter is, again, this is why I thank these brothers right now that are doing this to break this down for everybody. And, and shout out to YouTube, shout out to wherever you can find this information at, the, the different commentaries that you can read from, the different um, uh, Bible studies that are out there that displays what's really going on. It's such a beautiful thing that we can able, we're able to you know, go back and really understand what it is that God wanted us to know at this time. And it wasn't that she was just shocked and just threw out, oh, God. Nah, come on now. Let's 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 be real about some things now. Let's be real, and that that's not one of them. That's not a hill that anybody should die on. Going against the whole point of why Moses is is bringing this up, right? He's not, you know, giving this story uh, to show that the angel of the Lord isn't God, right? He, he's revealing this episode to draw out who he is. But moreover, notice it's not simply Hagar. Right? It's not just Hagar who identifies him as God. Look closely again at verse 13. This is Moses writing this. That's right. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. So Moses says, this is the Lord who spoke to her. 
Right? That's right. And then That's he quotes right. her. Then he quotes her saying, you're a God who sees me. But Moses calls the angel the Lord. And the word there in Hebrew is Yahweh, Yahweh exactly. the divine and name. And of course, he's inspired mm. by the Holy Spirit to write this. So, so between the uh, uh, narrator, uh, Moses, and between the scripture and the Holy Spirit and the angel of the Lord and Hagar, we get the full picture. <laughs> yeah. The encounter with God, who appeared to her as a person, basically. Right. Right. So all the way at the beginning of the book of Genesis, we're already introduced to the angel of the Lord. Just what we would expect if the angel of the Lord is not something invented later in Scripture, uh, or it's just something that Isaiah is suddenly you know, right. trying to force back into the Old Testament. Even before the Exodus, the angel of the Lord is on the scene. He's interacting with the patriarchs. Amen. In fact, if people read the book of Genesis very closely, they'll notice more often than not, when Scripture speaks of the patriarchs hearing from God or interacting with God, it's the angel of the Lord. Amen. Amen. And thank you. These are, by the way, when I'm teaching on the Trinity, these passages that uh, uh, Anthony just mentioned are really dear to my heart because it's it's just rich with so many things that you can you probably can spend just a whole episode just talking about Genesis 16 alone. You know, and it's so really amazing how the angel of the Lord chose to appear for the first time to a slave woman. I mean, what does that tell you about mm. the care of God and also the fact that he appeared to a Gentile, right? You know, he didn't appear just to a descendant, you know, technically speaking, uh, uh, of Abraham, but to a Gentile promising her, you know, that certain things will happen. But of course, later on, he does the same thing, of course, with Sarah and uh, makes that uh, prophecy about Isaac. And, uh, you know, people need to spend time reading the Word of God and taking things out of context sometimes can be extremely damaging. All the time. As you know, when you take things out of context, we have whole doctrines that will emerge as a result of this. Mm -hmm. Brother, as always, thank you so much for your hard labor and thank you for uh, the effort that you've put to, uh, you know, into preparing for us uh, these rich passages. And I appreciate, of course, uh, your passion for the Word of God and uh, uh, the uh, basically uh, the the enlightenment that uh, the Holy Spirit is speaking to all of us through you and through these passages as well. So thank you again, and thank you to all of you who are watching us. Until we meet again, have a blessed day. Oh, thank you, Alpha D. Thank you. I tell you what, another amazing breakdown discussing who the angel of the Lord is, um, breaking down the fact of the understanding of the difference of the types of angels and how angel is and how. Everybody, again, perceives it to be when it's the little winged creatures that are just floating around and doing all that, how people like to see it. Uh, little babies with the trumpets, I've seen those a few times. Um, but those aren't necessarily just all of the angels. Angels just means messengers. So they did a great job of breaking that down and have that understanding. And again, talking about the angel of the Lord and how we know the angel of the Lord is not just some you know figure or just some random angel. The angel of the Lord is called Yahweh. The angel of the Lord is God. Uh, what's up, Justin? What's up, Una? Shout out to everybody in the chat. God bless everybody for showing up. Cheryl, uh, Brother Conley, DW, uh, Rabbi, appreciate all you guys showing up and showing love. So, got to have that understanding that the angel of the Lord is God. It's not some just normal angel or some random angel. The angel of the Lord isn't in the same category as these other angels. Uh, it's all about the context that goes in it. And much like, again, Alpha Deed was saying at the end, when people take things out of context, we get so many different wacky, inflatable, flaring off, playing two-man type uh, uh, faiths. See, right now, if I was like, if this was recorded, I'd then insert the Family Guy episode would have the wacky, wavy. But anyway, that doesn't matter about anything. But having that understanding is so very important of who the angel of the Lord is and the fact that the angel of the Lord is not just the same angel. And again, we can see that throughout the entirety of scripture. And again, like I stated earlier with the angel in Revelation that was not accepting any type of worship or anything like that. Um, but we can see the angel of the Lord accepting that worship and displaying the uh, um, the powers that only God has, uh, obviously omniscience and things of that nature. Uh, shout out to Brother DW putting that in the chat. So got to have that understanding of who the angel of the Lord is and uh, get these uh, heretical views out of there. Especially the one with, one thing I want to do, learn a little bit more about is why the uh, Jewish view on agency is the way that it is, or the Unitarian view of agency is the way that it is. Because uh, I just reacted to an Anthony Rogers video not too long ago, and I actually put it up sometime last week, about the understanding of even in the Talmud, that multiple spots and multiple places, they talk about the angel of the Lord being God, um, except in that one area where it kind of really 
throws a wrench in their particular beliefs. But, you know, so everywhere you go, the understanding of who the angel of the Lord is, is there. And that the angel of the Lord is God and not just some normal angel. So now we're about to get into part number two of talking about the angel of the Lord. So that was part number one. That was episode seven. If you want to watch these episodes without me jumping in or without any of the other uh, nonsense that comes from me, you can watch them. The descriptions are down below to all the channels or excuse me, the uh, the episodes. In every episode that I did, all the descriptions down below to either CIRA and the Nationals episodes and or Anthony Rogers. They both have them. So if you want to see them on Anthony Rogers, you can watch them on Anthony Rogers. If you want to see them on CIRA International, you can watch them on CIRA International. It's all there so that you can get it and, and continue to rewatch it and take notes and do all that fun stuff as well. So now we're about to get into episode number eight. Episode number eight, y'all. Man, a couple of weeks ago we started. One, two, now we're at eight. Moving along, learning, doing what we can. But uh, so episode number eight we're about to get into. This is part two of learning about the angel of the Lord. Hello everyone, this is Al-Fadi and I'd like to welcome you back to this episode of brand new series that we're going through myself and Anthony Rogers, which we have titled The Trinity or the Doctrine of the Trinity in the Old Testament. So far we have shown from the Old Testament that the members of the Trinity are clearly visible in a variety of ways and in different locations and by different books and prophets. And today, we are going to continue with our highlight of the person of the angel of the Lord, uh, which we later, of course, will tie back into the Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ. Anthony? Yo, real quick, I just thought about this. So obviously, this is all being recorded in the same day. How do I know this? It's because this brother ain't changed his shirt not one time. But what I did notice is that brother's been changing his headdressing different times. Because that was not the same one he had on last episode. He had a picnic. Uh, uh, basket color last time. Now I guess the all white with the black. Don't get me wrong. I'm rocking with it. Do your thing, Alpha D. But I just had to point that out because that just came to my mind. Shout out to that shirt too, by the way. I like that shirt. That's a nice shirt. Alpha D out here styling and profiling. Ric Flair type stuff. Thank you again for joining me. And uh, last time we started it talking about the angel of the Lord, and I think we ventured into Genesis 16 as one example. Looks like today we're going to continue our journey through Genesis as well. Yes, yes. We, so we've seen that the title itself is a reference to a divine person, right? The word angel doesn't mean a creature. Correct. Uh, it means messenger. And the full title, the angel of the Lord, is used to refer to a specific and special individual, right. namely a manifestation of God. And we saw that in the case of the angel of the Lord's appearance to Hagar in Genesis 16, where Hagar refers to him as God, and Moses refers to him as Yahweh. That's right. It's a, it was an interesting observation, by the way. Thank you for pointing that out. Right. Now, here today, we have, we're have we going to look at Genesis 31 to start off. And we're sort of picking up the story midway, but uh, those who've read Scripture uh, will be familiar with the story. Those who haven't should go back and read it. But basically, Jacob has prospered uh, in the house of his father-in-law, Laban. When he watches over the animals, his tend to uh, mate and, and produce better than Laban's do. And ultimately, ultimately, that's because God himself has been with Jacob. And so we pick up the story where Jacob... Uh, has a dream, and it's interesting what happens in the dream. Uh, so let's read that. Now, real quick, as they're about to read this, so it, the prompter is up. The verses are up right there. It's breaking down. Obviously, the underlying is what they're going to try to get to. For all those who are just jumping in, and if I didn't state it earlier from last time, this is one of the times where you just take notes. If you're watching this, if you see the screen, start writing down and, and highlighting and doing what you can in your Bibles or in the Bible app because you can take notes in that as well. Uh, I don't know if you can on Bible Gateway or Bible Hub, but I know in the Bible app you can. So take those, take what you see on the screen and note it up for yourself and also for those that you may be trying to lead to the Lord who may be lost if they're in those heretical views. So this isn't just for, you know, us to hear at one time. No, we got to be able to take it in and absorb it. And this is why I love doing what it is that I do, because I get to learn and, and take all this stuff in all the time. So remember, take these notes, do what you can, and then obviously use it to the betterment to move 
uh, the kingdom forward. So if you're talking to anybody in the uh, comments or just anybody in your workspace or whoever, you can take these notes, you can take these conversations and, and teach and, and do what we can to spread the gospel. In, in verse 10, it says, it came about at the time when the flock were mating that I lifted up my eyes and saw in a dream, and behold, the male goats which were mating were striped, speckled, and mottled. Then the angel of God said to me in the dream, so it's the angel of God who is appearing to him in his dream and speaking to him. And here's what the angel says. Jacob, and I said, here I am. He said, lift up now your eyes and see that all the male goats which are mating are striped, speckled, and mottled. For I have seen all that Laban has been doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar, where you made a vow to me. Now arise, leave this land, and re return to the land of your birth. And that's interesting because he said, then the angel of the Lord, or the angel of God, said mm -hmm. to me, and the angel identified himself as, I am Yahweh. Right. So, so now you have not just Hagar calling him God, or Moses. Now the angel himself says, I am God. And he, we're not going to go look at this, but it shows you that there's a previous encounter where Jacob sees the angel of the Lord, and this is what the angel's referring back to. That account is found in Genesis 28. Right. And you also have reference to this uh, elsewhere in Scripture, Genesis 35. Or later, uh, again, you'll have this reference back to Jacob's encounter at Bethel. So Jacob here identifies the angel of the Lord as God. And that leads us into our, our next uh, verse where uh, – it, it does a number of things that I think are highly instructive. So in Genesis 40. So for those out there that are the Unitarians or the Jehovah's Witnesses or whatever that love to talk about agency, is it a part of the agency to be like, yep, I am God. That's who I am. I'm not just a messenger. I'm just not just an angel. I'm just not a whatever. I am God. God of Bethel. That's what people in agency are allowed to do. So if, uh, let me pick a random name, John Scott. Shout out to John Scott. If John Scott was going out, and he was going to share a message that I gave with him. He can be like, yo, I'm Albert. And this is what I say. Nah, 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 nah. I think he has to be like, yo, Albert says this. Do, 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 says what I say. So pretty sure that's more or less how agency works. Not the fact that John Scott can then say, I am Albert. Because I believe, and I think everybody else would kind of uh, agree that, you know, anybody other than God shouldn't be claiming that they are God. So that's a bit blasphemous, I would say. And if you're a Muslim, that's a bit shirk, or a lot of shirk, really. So we don't want to do that, and I don't believe, again, that's not how agency works, and nobody should believe that that's how agency works. But anyway, let's get back to it. Eight, our next slide. Notice what it says here. This, this is Jacob now at the end of his life. He's about to bless his descendants, specifically right. Ephraim and Manasseh, the offspring of Joseph, who was a favored son of, of Jacob's. But listen to how he blesses uh, the, the descendants of Joseph. He, it says, he blessed Joseph and said, and follow this carefully, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. Mm. Now, what, what most people won't notice here is that the word bless in Hebrew is singular. It means may he bless. Right. And the idea is that it refers back to everything Jacob has just said. The God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who's been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, may he bless the lad. These titles all refer to the same person. Amen. And what I want to mm. say, there's something called parallelism in the Hebrew, and that's what, what we're seeing here, this clause, the God and then the next one says the same God, he says, is the God and identifying him who has been my shepherd. Here is the God before whom my forefathers, who is also the angel mm. who has redeemed me. This, right. this, and this are one and the same. Sheesh, y'all. Sheesh. The struggle, the struggle that people have to go to to fight against what's in our faces, what's plain to see. No agency. Nope, this is straight up who the angel of the Lord is. The angel of the Lord is God. And we know from John that nobody's seen the Father. But God has been seen. Angel of the Lord has been seen by many, by many folks. 
And we know, thank God, by the uh, uh, the Holy Spirit, and obviously people are able to break it down, you know, through the Holy Spirit. We know who the angel of the Lord is. The angel of the Lord is Jesus. Um, when, you know, uh, and John again, when Jesus is talking about how Abraham didn't treat me this way or anything like that, it's because the angel of the Lord who was seen, Yahweh who was seen, God who was seen, was Jesus. Before, before he put, put on flesh, he was there. So the uh, the son made him known. The son makes the father known. Thank God for that. See, when, when scripture just connects, it's a beautiful thing. When the scripture just puts together, it's an amazing masterpiece of work. But without the Trinitarian truth, without the real truth, you won't be able to see that. You won't be able to reconcile that. You have to, again, make up some things like agency or whatever else they want to use that goes against the end of the Lord being God. So, ah, man, it's right there. Again, shout out to these brothers, Alpha D, Anthony Rogers, breaking it down. Again, take the notes, write them down, put it on replay, uh, clip this, do whatever you got to do to make sure that if you don't know, now you know. So it's right there for everybody. Basically. Right. So so this, this means then that the one who spoke to Abraham is the one who spoke to Isaac. Is, the, is one. the one who spoke to Jacob. Exactly. So Jacob's saying, this was their God, he was my God. But did you notice the, the terms used there? One, one that I want to highlight is the term redeemed. This is the first use of redeemed in the redeemed. Bible. Redeemed. That's right. And usually, most people recognize the first occurrence of important words is itself important. Exactly. Here, redemption is associated with the angel. What did we see in the passage we started out with this series with in, in Isaiah 63? When God comes to redeem Israel, he does so by means of the angel of his presence. That's right. That's right. So, so this, is, this is why this passage is especially instructive. Notice Jacob is saying, this is what God has been for me and for my forefathers. But he's also praying for his descendants. He's saying, will this God be the same for them? May he be to them what he has been for me and my forefathers. So he's actually praying for the people that will come after him, namely the Israelites who will be brought out of Egypt by the angel of the Lord who's going to redeem them. So you see again how wonderfully scripture holds together here. In fact, uh, if we turn there, uh, the next passage that uh, we have slides for is Exodus 3. And, and this is something that a lot of people just read right over. Everybody recognizes that God appeared to Moses. Yo, this is actually really cool in a way because I have a video that I have in the vault for when I can't continue to put out videos with Dr. Michael Heiser. And uh, Dr. Michael Heiser is actually, except he kind of did it in reverse, but he has a lecture where he's breaking this exact way of connecting the angel of the Lord um, to the uh, uh, prior verse in Genesis, from Exodus to Genesis, and how the redemption and everything like that and who um, the angel of the Lord is here. It's amazing. So that's pretty cool that, you know, Dr. Michael Heiser broke it down like that. Obviously, Anthony Rogers. I'm pretty sure a lot of folks break it down like that because that's just what the truth points to. So trust and believe Dr. Michael Heiser reaction on the way with this particular, these couple verses in there. So that's going to be actually pretty cool. And also the fact that, uh, well, how long ago? Man, actually, that was probably a couple weeks ago that I had recorded that one. So should be coming out soon. Shout out to Dr. Michael Heiser. Rest in peace. And again, all the all the scholars that are able to bring it together like this so that we can get a good understanding. In at the burning bush, M Muslims have trouble with this, right? They they don't know what to do because yeah, on I mean, the, one, the Quran does talk about it. I don't know why yeah. they have a problem with it in the Bible. <laughs> yeah, they they have difficulty with the idea that God can somehow. Uh, enter into creation and converse with creatures. But Muhammad, you know, if he didn't think that was possible, he made the mistake of including the story of Moses in That's the right. Quran. Exactly. Right? Well, here, when we look at the actual account of the burning bush, notice who it says in verse 2 actually appeared to Moses. The angel. Yeah. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. But now as we go to verse 5, or verse 4, after this, in verse 4, notice what it says. When the Lord saw that he turned aside, meaning Moses, when the Lord saw that Moses turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush. So in verse 2, he's called the angel of the Lord. Right. 
In verse 4, he's called God. So it's being used interchangeably here, technically speaking. Right. Yeah. Right. So the author of Scripture has no trouble with this. He, he knows, like most people don't, that the word angel doesn't mean a created heavenly being, per se. It can be used for them, but it's, it's simply a reference to someone coming and speaking. It doesn't have to mean a creature. So he has no trouble saying that this one, this the angel of the Lord, is himself God appearing to men. And so as it goes on in verse 5, it says, then he said, do not come near here. And this is important for people to remember, especially for, for future episodes. We're going to see that this is relevant later on as well. But he, that is God, in the midst of the bush, the angel of the Lord said, don't come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. Holy ground. He said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God mm. of Isaac, and the God mm. of Jacob. Mm. Remember, that's, that's Jacob's prayer, right? Amen. He has been my God. I pray that he will also be God to my descendants. Amen. And then it says, Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Now look how God identified himself to uh, Moses. He expected him to know that this is the same faithful God who appeared to your forefather 400 years earlier. Mm -hmm. I appeared to them. And just as I made that covenant promise to Abraham that I will rescue his descendants back in Genesis 15, look, he indeed appeared, you know? You know, one of the things that's really beautiful, we don't have the slide for it, but people can look at it. When you look at the names that we have for that generation of Israelites that are there under Moses, uh, there, there's something that, we, uh, that you see in the Bible that's called a theophoric name, and that's where a name points to their faith in the God of Israel, right? Uh, you have a name like Adonijah, that's the name of uh, right. a later yeah. Israelite, and his, the, the name means my Lord is Yahweh, or Yahweh is my Lord. That's right. Well, but what's interesting is when you look at that generation of people that Moses leads out of Israel, their names don't have God's name in them. It's almost like, uh, in a sense, uh, because they've been there for so long that people are starting to lose hope. But there is one person whose parents have the name of God in it, and it's Moses. Remember, the name of his mother is Yahabed, which right. means Yahweh is glorious. And so it's almost as if, you know, his in, in Moses' mother's family, the faith in the God of Israel is still alive and burning. Right, and right. through her, then, it, it's most appropriate that the one that would be raised up by God to deliver Israel is, uh, is her child. Amen. Uh, so th this is also, we should just, you know, before closing it out, uh, this is the same context where Moses later, uh, it, you know, in the next slide we, we have verses 7 through 9 in Exodus 3. That's right. And uh, this is where God basically is, is telling Moses uh, that he's seen the affliction of the Israelites, right? The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. And remember, that's what we read in Isaiah 63, right. where it says Rahab, that Rahab, you know, and uh, yeah, where where it yeah. says that uh, the, that God, in all their affliction, He was afflicted, and the angel of His presence that's saved right. them. That's right. This is what it's referring back to. But so here, uh, God is appearing to Moses. He says, "I've seen the affliction of my people. I've given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters." Because, for uh, I am aware of their sufferings. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Mm. And so he's telling Moses Almost. why he's come now. He made a promise to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He's now fulfilling that, hearing the outcry of his descendants. He's now come in response to their prayers. And he's specifically telling Moses, I'm going to send you to them and to Pharaoh, and, and you're going to tell Pharaoh to let them go, and you're going to tell them, come with me. And Moses asked the natural question here, uh, that is, you know, well, I'm going to go there. <laughs> what am I going to say? Who's going to believe me? Right, right? exactly. And, uh, and then so Moses, the one thing he does uh, in uh, the following verses is he asks God uh, for his name. If you look... Uh, Look, looking at verses 10 and 12, it says, Therefore, come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign to you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought up the people out of Egypt, uh, you will worship God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, 
I am that I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Mm. So this is that famous passage where mm-hmm. God explains the meaning of his name. But again, who is it that Moses is speaking to? God. Right? It's, it's, it's God. It's the angel of the Lord. Right? We read further in verse 15, God furthermore said to Moses, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, the Lord, which is Yahweh, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is my memorial name to all generations. That's right. That's right. It's beautiful, as always. Thank you. And, of course, this concludes um, Episode 8, which means that we will be venturing into Episode 9. And I can tell you and assure you we're not done yet. Mm-hmm. because this series have a lot, basically, of passages that we still need to go through. Quickly, brother, what else should people expect as we continue digging deeper into the Scripture? Okay, well, we'll see some more passages about the angel of the Lord and additional evidence that the angel of the Lord is the coming Messiah. We'll also be focusing upon the Holy Spirit. We haven't said as much about the Spirit yet. We did in the first several episodes with our starting passage, Isaiah 63, Uh, But we've focused so far on God the Father and on the angel of the Lord. We'll Mm -hmm. do some more on that, as I've said. And then we'll look more at the Holy Spirit uh, as we start to wind down towards uh, the the conclusion, at least of this period of episodes on the Trinity in the Old Testament. Amen. Thank you, brother. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Until we meet again, have a blessed day. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you. And again, for everybody who doesn't know, the whole series is on Alpha D's channel, which is CIRA International, as well as Anthony Rogers' channel, titled Anthony Rogers. So if you want to see the full series on either one of those, go check them out. Um, obviously, if you go to CIRA International, you'll get a bunch, a bunch of good material when it comes to not only the Trinity in the Old Testament, but uh, combating Islam, breaking down the historical claims of Islam and the nonsense of Islam. CR International does an amazing job. Alpha Deed, if I'm not mistaken, is an ex-Muslim who uh, came to know God, uh, if I'm not mistaken, while in college. I could be wrong, but I'm not, it might have been in college. But So he has a, a good bit of knowledge when it comes to Islam and also just refuting the nonsense that it is. He brings on people, obviously, like um, Anthony Rogers, Sam Shamoon, David Wood, Jay Smith, uh, Hatun Tosh, everybody who basically is anybody that goes after and debates and, and shows the truth and the lies of Islam, CRA International. And if you go to Anthony Rogers' channel, Anthony Rogers just breaks down amazing, amazing scriptures. He has uh, his debates on there. If you haven't seen his debate with Sean Griffin, murdered that fella. My gosh, it was bad. They got two debates on there um, where one of them was, does the father have a body? And the other one was, uh, I can't remember that one, but that was bad too. That was both bad. It was bad, it was bad. So Anthony Rogers got a good bit of, uh, information on there. He got short form content, long form content. Check him out if you're not Anthony Rogers. Thoroughly enjoy that. So I enjoyed this series so far. I'm getting a lot out of it. Going to get some great, great information about who God is, who he was shown to be in the Old Testament, um, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Like how Anthony Rogers was saying in the earlier episodes, was talking about the Holy Spirit a lot. So you guys, if you haven't seen episodes one and two, you know, you can check them out on my channel as well. So Go check those out to get a full understanding of what's been going on up until then. Love, love, love this series. So very glad that we're going over it, learning, doing what we can to get a good understanding of the Trinity in the Old Testament. Now, I was on my way to church today and from church, and I was listening to a debate with James White and this fella named Matt Baker. I'm going to say his name was. Worst debate I've ever seen, bar none, because this dude, Matt Baker, don't know what he was doing up there. He was just crying and complaining the whole time. It was bad. It was bad. But in the debate, it was about textual criticism. In the debate, uh, Matt Baker was talking about how there's so many people that talk about the Trinity not being exposed or not being uh, seen in Scripture until the New Testament. And I kind of find that weird as there's many of many scholars. Uh, I would like to think that, you know, Anthony Rogers is a scholar. He's a doctor. You know, that's really all you need to be a scholar, I think. But, you know, there's a lot of scholars that I see that that talk about the Trinity being the Old Testament and are able to break it down. And people who may not even necessarily be deemed as scholars. Um, obviously, Sam Shamoon be one of the people that can break down the Trinity in the Old Testament as well. And multiple other people. But 
it was kind of like it was weird to hear that people like William Lane Craig, for example, I guess he's quoted anyway of saying that, oh, yeah, the Trinity's not in the Old Testament or who else said that? Uh, that was speaking of Dr. James White. I don't think he disagrees that it's in the Old Testament. I just think that he focuses more so on the fact that it's between the uh, um, you know, last book of the Old Testament and first book of the New Testament. So that's his big thing right there. But it's kind of weird when I hear that, because when I see brothers like this break it down, it's just so evident. It makes so much sense. And again, it fits all together. And then also when we take into account the other information that we have from people like Dr. Ben Summers and others that talk about how even the early Jews believed in, you know, a multi-personal God and stuff like that. So that's kind of weird that people still take that claim. But, hey, it is what it is. You know, people are going to believe whatever it is that they want to believe. But, you know, I'm here to say today that I believe wholeheartedly that from beginning of time until now, the Trinity has been on display throughout. It's not something that was secretive. It was not something that was hidden. It's not something that just came about. It's something that God has revealed to us because that's who God is. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the, the one being of God who's three persons. That's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful thing. The only one, the only true God. You know, all these other gods that people like to bring up, these heretics like to say, oh, these triads, oh, Zeus, oh, whatever, yada, 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 the Rome, Jupiter triad thing. Not the same. Not the same at all, because they're all three different beings. They're not the one being. So, But the truth is a beautiful thing to learn, and I'm so very thankful today that the good Lord has opened my eyes to what the truth is and who he is. I'm so very thankful for that. Hopefully you guys are getting that understanding as well in the comments, who's ever watching later on. Get that understanding of who the truth is. If you're on the fence, if you're struggling, I encourage you to watch more of these conversations on uh, YouTube or uh, the, the different marriages and marriages of books and commentaries that you can find on the matter. Um, and then I also encourage you, too, to watch the other side's debates and watch the other side's view on things. I love going to, um, I think what's it called, Bible Hermeneutics, I think it is, Bible Hermeneutics on Google. Because if I'm not mistaken, that's ran by a bunch of Unitarians and or not Jehovah's Witnesses. I think it's Unitarians. But and also, there's also another one that I go to a lot and they kind of give the Unitarian perspective. And it's amazing that we can see what it is that they believe and how it's it's just so, so very lacking when it comes to piecing together scripture. And again, things like the agency argument, how it just doesn't make absolutely any sense when you actually break it down or shoot, just even surface level nonsense about uh Jesus not claiming to be God or, you know, none of the apostles claiming him to be God or anything like that. It's it's crazy how they have to cope with all that stuff. So, so uh, uh, yeah, I encourage everybody, if you don't know, go to some of these other channels, go to the JW channel, go to any of these heretical channels and really watch what it is that they say and see how much, man, we we are blessed that we're not trapped like them. But we also have a duty to you know do what we can to continue to spread the truth so that those people that are lost can come to uh come to the truth because as much as we have lung or excuse me breath in our lungs right now we have an opportunity to bring as many people as we can to christ so we got to be able to know the truth got to be able to uh show the truth and again shout out to these brothers for being able to do that so if we don't know we can learn from them and that's what it's about here so I appreciate all you guys pulling up. I am actually going to end early. Usually I do these things pretty long, but I have a lot of things to do. I have a lot of recording I have to get done because this past week, man, it's been raining bad, storming. I couldn't record nothing. I have stuff in the vault, so I was able to put some stuff out. But usually I at least try to put out at least one video a day, but it was kind of hard because I didn't have that many things in the vault. But So I got to get to that because I don't know if it's going to be nice all week like it is now or if it's going to start storming again. So. I got to record, record, record so I can put some stuff out. And then tomorrow, though, for those who are going to be free at 1130 Eastern Standard Time, uh, probably for about an hour or so, right before God Logic comes on. Well, he usually comes on later in the day, but I'll be going live again, talking about some more Quran contradictions. It was a great live yesterday. Shout out to the brother Winston and Mutas for coming up and assisting your boy when it comes to uh, talking about these Quran contradictions. So we're going to be doing another live tomorrow. So three lives in a row, back to back to back. Um, and then hopefully the next live I can only guarantee will be probably Sunday. But I am going to also try to get some testimonies in because uh, my brother John Scott is in the chat. I know he's uh, been talking about what well, I've asked him, you know, if he can come up and share his testimony. So we're going to see if we can get that. Uh, Jesus's Lord was 
on here. I know that earlier. So, you know, she's going to be coming up here to share testimony. If y'all see Hebrew World in the comments, just know that he's ducking the smoke. He was supposed to then come up here and share his testimony. But just know between us, I do know the issue. I'm just playing with him. But, you know, Hebrew World, by the way, Hebrew World, if you're uh, not following Hebrew World, go follow Hebrew World. He's another reaction channel that does a great job. He um, reacts to same things I react to in a way, but he also reacts to some of the um, stuff in the news that I really don't get into. Um, some of the the uh, hot topics, I guess, if you will. So great channel. Love this brother right here. Hopefully he comes and shares his testimony soon. We're going to get that together for sure, for sure, because this brother's been supporting me for a long, long time, and I support this brother as well. Uh, if you haven't checked out Here I Am, Lord, go find uh, follow that brother. He's been somebody who's popping up like crazy recently doing his thing with live streams and everything else like that. Hopefully I'll have him on as well. With the, with the nicer weather coming up, and me, I'm from the Midwest. I'm from Ohio, so we have all four seasons, and my internet is not the greatest. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. But internet's not the greatest, so sometimes it's hard to do these live streams because I don't want them to be jacked up and just like, you know, skipping all this and lagging, and then, you know, my voice keeps going, but my face is stuck like a, a karate movie from back in the day. So I don't want none of that. So hopefully with the nicer weather, we can get all these uh, testimonies in because that's one of the biggest things I do want to do is I love just to hear about what God has done in people's lives. And that is something that I do the reactions for that. I do the reactions to build the channel up so that when I bring people on to share the testimony, that we can hear about uh, what God is doing in people's lives. Because that's ultimately what I enjoy bar none the most. I enjoy the reactions. I love the reactions because I'm learning, I'm growing, but there's nothing more I love than hearing about what God has done in somebody else's life. So that's going to be the goal. That is going to be the goal when it comes to what's coming up. And I do apologize for those who uh, uh, would like a schedule. I ain't got no schedule. I just pop up when I pop up. The only thing I do got scheduled is these Sundays. I do my best to get into these, uh, these uh, Trinity live streams. But with that being said, God bless you guys. Going to record some more. If I don't show up now, I'll just keep talking and my, my outro suck. But appreciate you all for pulling up. Catch you guys next time. See you all tomorrow. God bless.